Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and today we continue our examination of the Greek poetic playwright tradition. And rather than continuing chronologically with Sophocles, we are going to look at Euripides before we examine Sophocles. I think uh, thematically, symbolically, and in terms of <clears throat> intellectual content, examining Euripides after Aeschylus makes more sense than reading Sophocles after Aeschylus. And in doing so, we will also be able to see the further dialectic of the Greek poetic tradition, as well as the interplay between Euripides and Aeschylus and Sophocles, Sophocles with Euripides, which of course is also going to be important when you end up reading Aristophanes, because Aristophanes pits Euripides against Aeschylus in The Frogs, but Sophocles is also a minor character uh, in that play as well. And so to begin our examination of Euripides, we should understand that Euripides in many ways was an oracle of modernity. That is, the themes that concerned Euripides seem extremely modern and prescient. Themes that many of us living in the 21st century still deal with. Cry, cry in triumph, carry on the dancing on and on. This peace between Athena's people and their guests must never end. All seeing Zeus and fate embrace, down they come to urge our union on. Cry, cry in triumph, carry on the dancing on and on. That is how Aeschylus ended his Oresteia trilogy. The furies which had so hounded and haunted Orestes had transformed into co-laborers with Athena, singing and dancing for the joy of reason and civilization. Euripides, the great cynic and blasphemer, took, of course, a darker and starker approach to the gods and Greek civilization. Perhaps one of the reasons why he was less successful than his predecessors in being awarded at festivals and competitions for his writings. Uh, Euripides only won first place in five events, far short of the dozens of awards won by Aeschylus and Sophocles. Nevertheless, Euripides is one of the cornerstones of the Greek playwright tradition, and the Bacchae is a classic cornerstone of Western literature. As we give an introduction to Euripides, we will mostly be focusing on the Bacchae, but also uh, reflecting on the Medea, Iphigenia and Aulis, the Trojan women, Hecuba, Andromache, the so-called Trojan or the war plays, but we will provide a more in-depth study of those war plays or the Trojan plays for another time. Euripides' predecessors, Hesiod, Homer, Aeschylus, all belong to the first movement of Greek literature and its philosophical implications. Hesiod's world was one of strife and openly naked violence. And uh, we have a lecture on Hesiod in context and in companionship with Homer. Uh, that is Homer's Iliad and the shield of love and strife, the role of love and strife in cosmic pathos in the two great uh, founders of the Greek literary uh, tradition. And as I've written elsewhere concerning Hesiod's agonistic masterpiece, Hesiod's account of the birth of the gods is a triumph of the depraved imagination. It is ripe with sexual images and metaphors as well as violence. Though in many ways, primitive at least in comparison to the more developed stories of the gods 
and their skaldduggery that came after Hesiod, his graphic imagination of the birth of the gods cannot be missed by any reader and reveals the reality of the birth and character of the pagan gods as opposed to observing some of the more mild paintings by Titian or Peter Paul Rubens. But Hesiod's world of strife and violence was far more ancient than Hesiod himself. In an era of great transformation, social and intellectual, it seems to me that Hesiod's account of the birth of the gods in lust and violence represents, again, that older and more sublime oral tradition of the cosmogonic reality of the ancient past. Hesiod wrote his short classic in response to ongoing changes, changes that had led to the rise of Homer and the competition alluded to by the two Greek poets. Homer's two epics deal with strife as well, but they are not celebrations of naked ambition as is Hesiod's poem. Instead, they sing of men and a family, Achilles, Odysseus, and with Odysseus, Penelope, and Telemachus. Both epics are set during the Nadir, or the backdrop of the Trojan War. Strife and violence spill out over the beaches and sands of Troy. Strife and violence erupt over the seas and inside caves and on islands during Odysseus's journey home. The Iliad is a grand epic combining strife and love, and how strife can be superseded by love, which is what the Odyssey primarily deals with. The enduring images of the Iliad are strife and love, as we've just said, and in that order too. Homer doesn't negate the reality of strife, but he turns the strife-filled cosmos of Hesiod on its head and opens the cosmos up to love, the love that led Achilles to weep with Priam and return Hector's body, and the love that drew Odysseus home to Penelope and Telemachus. The conclusion of Homer's wellspring moves beyond the forgiving love experienced by Achilles and Priam in each other's arms. The conclusion of Homer's genius is how strife brings out the best in love, the love that reunited a family and brought about their happiness in each other's arms, which occurred through the prism of strife, just as the medium of strife allowed Achilles to learn love and offer healing to a grieving father, even if for but a brief moment in time. By the time that we reach Aeschylus, love and reason have become the outcome of the struggle with strife that humans must contend with. Orestes appeals to Athena and Apollo that the murder of his mother, Clytemnestra, and her lover, Aegisthus, was done out of love, fidelity, for Agamemnon and the will of Apollo. Clytemnestra's murder of Agamemnon was done out of hate and infidelity, both to her spouse and to the gods. Orestes' murder of Clytemnestra, at least as he presents it to the gods at the end of the Eumenides, was done again out of love and fidelity to his father and the gods. Athena, in the end, rules in favor of Orestes and calms the wailing cry of the Furies, who come to celebrate the triumph of persuasion, of reason, in a cosmos finally moving from darkness and blood to light and justice. And so that is some of the contextual background to the Greek literary tradition leading up to Euripides. And again, we have lectures on Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey dealing with love, family, and pathos, we have already an introduction to Aeschylus, but for those who may not have heard those lectures in our previous episodes, before we can begin to delve deeper into Euripides, I thought it was necessary for a concise refresher of the movement of Greek literature up to Euripides. So Euripides wrote in an anxious and transformative age. Uh, the Persians had just been defeated and Athens, Athena, had ascended as the premier power among the Greeks. Euripides was but a young man when Athens ascended to her infamous glory that still mesmerizes and haunts our civilization today. The Athenian Empire 
as recounted by Thucydides in his History of the Peloponnesian War, was exceptional because it was not the product of conquest, but of mutual de defense. No other empire, the Athenian delegates argue in the disputation over the declaration of war at the end of Book I of the History of the Peloponnesian War, had ever been formed in such a manner of mutual defense of nations rather than the intent of conquest. And this, of course, might sound familiar to people living today, especially when you consider uh, the American Empire and how it actually mirrors the Athenian Empire more closely than it does the Roman Empire. But that's neither here nor there. The later plays of Euripides, including the Bacchae, are set, however, in dire and dark times. Athens's grand Sicilian conquest had failed. The Peloponnesian War had turned against Athens, and the city was suffering from civil war, sexual depravity, and the general disintegration of its society. Euripides might be reaching back to ancient and mythological figures in his plays, but the tales and the fates that he tells are eerily similar to the Athens at the end of the 5th century on the eve of the death of Euripides. The darkness of Euripides' tragedies coincides with the nadir of Athenian grandeur. It is well known that many of his plays composed during the Peloponnesian War, like the Trojan Women, are veiled commentaries on the state of Athenian society and the war itself. The Athens celebrated by Athena and the transformed Furies at the end of Aeschylus's Eumenides and the Athens eulogized by Pericles in Thucydides's History of the Peloponnesian War, that's in Book 2, the very famous uh, moment called Pericles's Funeral Oration, one of the uh, many episodes within the History of the Peloponnesian War that is generally still studied today is not the Athens that Euripides composed his late plays to reflect. That is, the Athens of Aeschylus and the Athens of Pericles is not the Athens of the final decade of the 5th century. The Bacchae, among the last of Euripides' plays, was composed in a tumultuous city filled with strife and conflict. And though the play is set in Thebes, the tragedy that befalls Pentheus is in fact an esoteric commentary on the state of Athenian society and the insufficiency of the gods of the city. Athena is, of course, the goddess of wisdom, of reason and persuasion, alongside being a strong goddess of war. But her wisdom and justice are what primarily define her, and that her name is bore by Athens. Athens is supposed to be the wise and just city in mere reflection of its patron deity, which exonerated Orestes and transform the Furies. But something wicked to Greece comes. This is the reality of the situation when the Bacchae opens. Dionysus travels from the eastern lands. Dionysus, though nominally a Greek god, is presented by Euripides here as if a foreign oriental sex god. Moreover, the power of Dionysus is immediately made known to the crowd or the reader when he says, I come from Lydia, its territories teeming with gold, and from rich Phrygia. I am all conqueror in the sun-beaten steppes of Persia, the walled cities of Bactria, the, the wintry lands of Medea, and Arabia Felix, land of the blessed. All Asia is mine, and along the fringes of the sea, the pinnacled glory of all those mingled cities of Greeks and many races. Everywhere Dionysus goes, he conquers. No land, whether south, east, north, or now west, can escape the consuming madness of Dionysus, Bacchus, and the Bacchans. We may have now forgotten, but it certainly wasn't lost on 5th century Athenians, that dancing is an intrinsically sexual act. Dancing is the great rite, the grand ritual, 
that Dionysus brings with him, as Dionysus proclaims, Elsewhere, everywhere, I have established my sacraments and dances to make my Godhead manifest to mortals. Everywhere, indeed, the chorus which lauds over Dionysus sings for sacred dances and joy in the mountains, the wild delight of Bacchus in his soul, his ritual he undergoes, Sibele's orgies, great mothers, he shakes the thyrus on his high, he, si he shakes the thyrus on high. The women of Thebes are entranced as if sex slaves by this new god and his rituals. They lose their clothes and their minds, dancing and howling wildly on the mountain at night. The social order of the city is so threatened by this new coming god and the madness that he brings that Pentheus orders Dionysus arrested and his men prepared for battle to put an end to this threat. Pentheus, as king of Thebes, has a duty to protect his citizens and the social fabric, the social order, of his civilization, which he, correctly, perceives to be threatened by the arrival of Dionysus. It is now well accepted that Euripides did not have a change of heart late in life. Euripides had always been critical of the Greek gods. He was, still at the eve of his death, critical of the gods. And this is part of the ongoing uh, scholarly debates uh, among uh, concerning Euripides' plays. It used to be the classical view that Euripides was always critical of the gods. Beginning in the 20th century, uh, generally after World War II and in the 1960s and 1970s with the sexual revolution, that Euripides was sort of being freewheeling uh, free wheeling and playful with the gods and that he had abandoned his prior criticism, especially here in the Bacche. But now again, the tide has turned. Most classicists continue to believe that Euripides was always critical of the gods. So while depraved moderns may be sympathetic to Dionysus, Dionysus is hardly presented in any sympathetic light by Euripides. This is clear for anyone who simply reads the play without the lens of post-World War II and post-sexual revolution lenses on. Euripides sees little good in Dionysus after he viciously and brutally turns against Pentheus, intoxicating the king who giggles <laughs> like a girl and dresses like a woman to get a better view of the naked women of the city in their entranced ritual dancing and moaning. Pentheus, however, is not presented without his own faults. But as the play reaches its climax, we grieve for Pentheus, his mother and his grandfather, but hardly shed a tear for Dionysus. In fact, we turn on Dionysus and wish to tear him limb from limb, just as the Titans had done to him in mythological lore. The contemporary reading of fun-loving Dionysus against power-imposing Pentheus misses the obvious and more contextual reality of the play. And again, this reading of fun-loving Dionysus against power-imposing quasi-fascistic Pentheus is clearly influenced by post-World War II realities. That was never the case until World War II happened. You will not find among any of the commentaries on Euripides until the beginning or until the middle of the 20th century of this fun-loving Dionysus versus power-imposing Pentheus dynamic. Both Dionysus and Pentheus are in fact engaged in an exercise of power and will, not freedom versus tyranny as post-World War II readings tend to now assert. Pentheus may have acted with impiety towards this foreign oriental sex god but Pentheus certainly had the foresight, as the play reveals by his grisly dismemberment at the hands of the women of the city, including his own mother, of the threat that Dionysus posed. In Pentheus challenging Dionysus, the king is not challenging the free-loving and free-playing Dionysus, but challenging Dionysus' lust for control and power. After all, when Dionysus is introduced, 
If we recall, he proclaims his power of conquest and that all the world, sans helos, has been brought under his dominion. And again, if we go back to Dionysus' introduction, he has conquered all the world but Greece. Pantheus realizes the danger that Thebes and all of Greece is now in. And so he confronts this dangerous god, but is ultimately defeated. The contest between Pentheus and Dionysus is clearly one of power. Anybody who doesn't see that simply cannot read the actual text for itself. Pentheus understands the arrival of this foreign sex-crazed god as a threat to his power, but also the power and the social order of Thebes. Dionysus, in seeing Pentheus's seriousness in gathering his armies for battle and clearing out the mountains of the Bacchans, understands that his power is being threatened by Pentheus. So here you have the contest of the power of wills, the contest between the will of Pentheus and the will of Dionysus. Sacrilege and impiety are mere pretexts to kill the king, which is precisely what Dionysus concludes must happen for his power, not his free-loving and free-playing spirit, to survive. Dionysus moves the kill Pentheus to preserve his power, and nothing more than that. Irrespective of the reception and development of Dionysus in the subsequent uh, theological and theotic tradition, the Dionysus of Euripides is a cold, lustful, and power-hungry dark god of vindictive cruelty. Dionysus is a god of dark fear and manipulation. His dark presence fills Pentheus with fear, and when Pentheus challenged Dionysus' arrival, he manipulates the king to be torn limb from limb by his induced dancers. And we should not forget that in the play, that Dionysus does in fact manipulate Pentheus to dismember him in the most grisly and brutal of fashions. Euripides' gods are not the gods of Aeschylus, though they bear the same name. No, Euripides' gods are the gods of Hesiod, given a new cunning and manipulative makeover. Furthermore, they are depicted as clear threats to the human social order. At least Hesiod's gods fought among themselves and castrated the bodies and organs of fellow immortals Instead of ripping humans limb from limb, with their entrails spilling out into the laps of fanatically enraptured servants. It seems to me that Euripides is a great and scandalous humanist, as well as being, a moral, uh, as well as being morally astute to the problems concerning human-to-human -human relationships. Aeschylus's human progress is still controlled by the gods, as indicated by Athena's role at the end of the Eumenides. We labor with the gods and appeal to the gods in Aeschylus, but the gods ultimately have the final say. Euripides' human progress, if there is any progress in his tragedies, is not in the hands of the gods, but in the hands of humans. And this is something that I think most people miss in reading Euripides, but it is very important. Pentheus is brutally torn apart by the women of Thebes who, once freed from Dionysus' licentious spell, realize the depravity of their actions and mourn for him. Euripides, through Agave and the Chorus, remind us of the brutality and harshness of the world, especially the classical pantheon whose gods raped, murdered, and controlled others at whim. Dionysus, in standing over the dismembered body of Pentheus and observing the tragic scene of a man's mother holding her son's head as if a lion's head, defends himself by asserting that Pentheus's impiety justified his death. As Dionysus says, the sins of jealousy and anger made this Pentheus deal unjustly with one bringing blessings whom he disgracefully imprisoned and assaulted. But what blessings did Dionysus bring? Slavery and insanity are what Dionysus wrought. Indeed, Cadmus falls to his knees in slavery 
to Dionysus, crying out, Have mercy, Dionysus, for we have sinned. But who brought forth the sin of filicide in the play? Dionysus, not Pentheus or Agave. Agave's final words in the play are, Let us not meddle with Bacchants. In tearing her son apart in a crazed stupor, Agave apparently has had enough of being a Bacchant dancer and has returned to her senses and wants nothing to do with the god who caused her to tear her son apart like a crazed beast. As she says, others should deal with the Bacchants, let us depart in peace. It is the human characters who have and manifest moral realization in the play, not Dionysus. Cadmus awakens Agave and the women from their intoxication to see the horror and suffering they have wrought to poor Pentheus. Agave and the women take responsibility for their actions and weep for the king. In mournful exodus, it is the humanity of the Thebans, freed from Dionysus, which touches us most in this bleak and dark tragedy that W.B. Yeats recalled as if peering into the hollow sacristy to see the secretive and horrifying sacrament of a bloodthirsty God made flesh to feast on the flesh of his victims. During the introduction to the Trojan women, Euripides also presents Athena and Poseidon as conniving and jealous gods, making a pact to make the return journey of the Greeks as miserable as possible, even though Athena had fought on the side of the Greeks. Though composed 25 years earlier than the Bacchae, Euripides' Medea deals with, the same th uh, deals with the same theme of gods or humans for control of our destinies and dispositions. Medea has been slighted by Jason and her life and social standing has all been swept out from under her feet. Her brutal murder of her own sons is unforgivable, but Jason is equally not without any guilt. The gods are absent in the play, but not without being invoked. The rage of Medea brings death and destruction. The infidelity of Jason brings rage leading to death and destruction. In the second choral ode, Euripides tells us something scandalously shocking, at least in comparison to where Greek literature had been progressing uh, up, to the, up to his moment in time. As he says, Love is a dangerous thing, loving without any limit, discredit and loss it can bring. Love has entered the consciousness and vocabulary of the Greek literary philosophical tradition in large part thanks to Homer and Aeschylus. However, love in Euripides is scorned, shown to be hollow, and ultimately something very dangerous. Euripides' plays show us the hollowness and vanity, indeed the cruelty of the gods. Athena has been dethroned, and the empty gods who demand child sacrifices and capture entire cities and make them servile slaves have returned. Humans have once again been deprived of light and made into the toiling servants of the gods, whose cruel fates and sadistic impulses can visit us at any time. Moreover, love is also deconstructed throughout Euripides' many plays. The emphasis placed on love, as was the case with Medea, only come back to haunt her. Indeed, love made her a slave and did not bring her salvation, but cheaply disposed of her when socially and politically relevant. This, too, is true in the Trojan women, uh, Hecuba, Andromache, where the love exhibited by Hecuba and Andromache for a now burnt Troy and their slain husbands only add to their misery. Are the gods worthy of veneration? In answering this question, we must ask which gods? The Greek gods went through many faces, 
though they bore the same name. The gods born from Hesiod's pen were cruel and lustful gods who engaged in patricide and usurpation. The gods of Homer are equally mischievous, though Homer humanizes Eros and Philia and gives us great hope as he shifts our concentration away from the gods and to faded human beings. The gods of Aeschylus are just, as are, are just and persuasive, rational and loving, gods we can relate with and ultimately become co-laborers with. Aeschylus provides the synthesis of the hateful gods of Hesiod and the fatalistic but humanistic love of Homer. The gods of Euripides, however, are brutal, ruthless, and full of cruel surprises, the exact opposite of Aeschylus's gods, or the beautiful and sumptuously fleshly gods of Catholic Renaissance painters. The gods of Euripides are bloodthirsty and call for virgin sacrifices to procure blessing in war. Nevertheless, Euripides was, in my opinion, a moralist, but he was not locating the heart of morality in the gods, the cosmos, or even other humans. Euripides located the heart of morality in ourselves, as individuals, free from the bonds of the gods, and yes, even other persons. If we do find equally moral people where love can flourish, as Andromache did with Hector, that is no guarantee of the good life either. Just look at what happened to Andromache after Hector's death and the sack of Troy, and the agonizing pain Andromache subsequently suffered. It is also true, in the case of Medea, that Medea's love for Jason brought about her own demise. That is because she was trying to find salvation in another person, rather than finding it in herself. In this respect, Euripides was the first and most dramatic libertarian in Western history. We must look after ourselves and take responsibility for our actions, just as the women of Thebes do at the end of the Bacchae, especially Agave. It is only the humans in Euripides' plays that realize any sort of moral consummation. Only in accepting responsibility for ourselves and our actions can we have a social order worthy of being venerated and protected. The ultimate message of Euripides is the same message that Aristophanes has him speak in the frogs. Be weary of trusting others for your salvation. That message, I think, has reverberated down through history ever since Euripides put it into dramatic form. In so many ways, Euripides was, in fact, the oracle of modernity. Many of the themes that Euripides deals with are themes that we, as moderns, find very close to us indeed.